A lot of people, I think, thought when this quarantine started, it was going to be short term. And when it stretched out and stretched out and stretched out, they thought, okay, when it's over, everybody's going to just have such a pent up appetite for getting back to their life, such a pent up appetite for getting back to their jobs, back to their social activities, that they're just going to go rushing back out to the world. And I think people have really been surprised that they have regressed socially, emotionally, competitively, and that they're finding some things they took for granted earlier in their lives are now a bit intimidating. So they're kind of sticking their toe in the water a little bit. It is a time to rethink. And I've heard a lot of people talk to me about the fact that spending time with themselves has created a bit of an existential crisis. They've had some time to think, what is this really all about? I was doing all this stuff before that when I quit doing it, it seemed kind of silly that I took it so seriously. Yeah, it's powerful. I mean, you see this with care work. I write about this in my book, Pap. It's like, you know, people always say to me, Rush, what, what do men think about your book? And I'm like, no, 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 they're with me. You know, they want they want to spend time with their kids too. You know, you're the first time your dads who like didn't do the two hour commute and took their son to school or had them watch, you know, soccer. They became a part of the family. And they recognize that like that's good for reducing my diabetes and my heart attack levels and all of the it's healthy for me. And I feel alive. I feel present. So I do think that like we're going through this kind of existential crisis, like you said, in America, in terms of like ending this kind of hustle culture that we have. Drive, 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 work 80 hours a week. You know, don't put your head up. Don't have any joy. You know, don't spend time with your family or, you know, read a book. And I think people are like, no, 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 I don't want to live that way. You know, I want to live differently. And it, it is really this resistance, you know, towards in some ways what is like inherent, we think is inherent in a capitalist society, but that is at odds with living life. Um, and I, I do think, especially now, as this is like everything's opening up and you have to then set your own boundaries about how you want to interact and how you don't want to interact. That's like, that's a lot of permission to people and in giving them control back over, over their life is something that I think we should stop trying to fight. Yeah. My wife, Robin, tells me frequently, you know, there's no prize, right? I don't, what do you mean? She, there's no prize for the busiest person in the world. If you think there's a trophy at the end, there's not. Just calm down because it seems like I'm always having something to do. But I'm really blessed in that my vocation and avocation are one in the same. I really love what I do. So it's like I want to really sleep fast because I want to get back up and get to what I'm doing. And not everybody is that way. And I'm not that way every day. But most times, I'm really anxious to get back to what I'm doing because I enjoy it. But here's my question, because you have to message this differently than it has been in the past to young women and girls this difference between bravery and perfection. And I've never looked at it from a gender difference standpoint, but I've always told myself and everybody I work with that we strive for excellence, not perfection, mm -hmm. because perfection is kind of an excuse to sit on the sidelines. Right. It's like, oh, this essay isn't perfect. This picture isn't perfect. This project isn't perfect. That just gives you an excuse to not get in the game. Whereas if you strive for excellence, you just put it out there and you see what you got. But I'm really wondering if what your take is on what we're doing in colleges and universities today with young people in terms of preparing them for the competition of the real world. Because I always looked at universities as a place where we went for an exchange of ideas. It's a place where we went to hear someone that thought differently than ourselves, mm. where we went to have an honest intellectual exchange, debate, discourse. Now, a third of students think it's okay to yell down someone, the speaker that yeah. differs from your point of view. 
they demonstrate against having someone on campus that disagrees with them. They complain to administration if a professor or instructor has a different point of view and advances a course curriculum that requires them to resolve cognitive dissonance by taking the other side in an argument. We create safe spaces. We do those sort of things instead of causing them to deal with discord. I wonder what you think about that. You know, when I was in, uh, when I was at Harvard and I got my master's, um, the Taliban came to speak. And I think I'm so happy that I got to sit in that room and listen to what they had to say. Because I think the only way that you can fight and that you can be an activist and that you can shift is to understand what people who are diametrically opposed to what you believe say. You know, I've been, I wrote an op-ed the other day about abortion. You know, six out of 10 women who get an abortion are mothers. And there's been a lot of interesting comments on my feed. Now, I don't delete them. I read them, every single one. And so I think as a, again, and from from my perspective, I I want to give the opposing side room. I want to, I want to have relationships. I want to break bread with people who don't believe what I want, what I believe, because that's the only way that we can really, really, really push and re-examine, you know, our own argument and our own viewpoint. And the, and the reality is, especially in this, this country's, this country is so divided, but it's so also not divided, you know, because we push people to the opposing sides rather than try to find a common ground. And I think that that radically has to change. It's because the thing is, it's like, it's not actually building, like, it's, it's kind of like what I say about failure. Like I'm obsessed with Serena Williams and, you know, Serena Williams sits at the edge of her ability and a coach who's saying, do it again, do it again, do it again. The only way you can be great is if you do it again and do it again and do it again. Now, the only way I can be a great social servant, a warrior, a change maker is if I really understand what is driving people to believe what they believe and how do I get them to come over here a little bit, right? Like, so if I spent all my time talking to women, if I spent all my time talking to girls, I would never know how to change the behavior of men. I spent most of my time talking to men and audiences that may not, you know, and, and you know what, guess what? Now 50% of girls who code teachers are men. Half of my board are men. My first three funders to my Marshall Plan for Moms are men, right? Because the only way we're going to get to equality is with men as our allies and as our partners in crime. But that means that we ought to have a lot of conversations, a lot. Yeah. If people had that attitude, we would be having a lot of these conversations that aren't being had right now. I'm not saying that we should all just get together and have a group hug. There are legitimate differences, and people should embrace those differences, but you have to discuss them and find some way to recognize you're not going to get everything you want. You're not going to give everything they want. You've got to find a way to compromise and live with it. I'm not saying everybody should just say, oh, well, we'll just all get together and live in harmony. That will probably never happen. No. you have harmony on things like abortion or issues that have to do with literally life or death. There are going to be philosophical differences, religious differences, social differences, and you may never get to a point of agreement on that, but there's got to be some way to coexist, and you're yeah. never going to find that if you don't talk about it. Well, it's it's ironic, you know, we got to a place, you know, during the Trump years where almost it was a point of pride to uh, distance yourself from a family member or stop speaking to a family member who didn't have the same political viewpoint as you. And that's, that's not pride. That's, that's sad. And and so, you know, we got to move around, move away from that as being a badge of the, you know, again, the integrity that we have to our convictions and our ideas um, because the reality is, is I think a point of, um, I think when you know you've really made difference is when you have moved someone's opinion. They may not move all the way, 
but they've said, ah, oh, okay, I didn't, th- I didn't think about it that way. And, and, and I think that that is like really, really, really critical. I do think on college campuses that like I, you know, I went to the Kennedy School of Government. I heard a lot of people who didn't believe what I believed. And honestly, so much of who I am today and what I've learned and what I've built is by listening to the opposing side. I, I just think it's the only way that you grow, that you learn, 